here we go today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 2. We're going to continue our study in the book of Colossians and what God is trying to teach us about unmasking the cultural church, the modern church, which I think in many ways has gone away from God's heart, uh, trying to be culturally accepted sometimes in our desire to be, to be correct. We've kind of crossed over the line and maybe we're missing the point of our commission as a church, as a church family. The word masquerade means to operate under false pretense or character, to disguise oneself or to present a facade, to pretend pre to, pretend to be something or someone you are not. You know, a few weeks ago when we began this journey, we, we began by looking at the difference between someone who's trying to be a good Christian and someone who's trying to be a God Christian. And Paul lays it out very simply because, you know, we tend to think that a good Christian is someone who goes to church, reads the Bible, prays. They do all the religious function. But Paul says, no, that's not exactly true. He, he says a, a, a person who really is walking as a disciple, who is walking in intimacy with God, it's not about these outward things that they can do themselves, but rather by what God is doing in them, working through them. And, and so the result is, is that they're bearing fruit in every good work. They're growing in the knowledge of God. They're being strengthened with all power according to his might. And they, they have endurance, that is patience with circumstances as God would have patience because it brings them under God. And then that they have patience with people. They would treat other people the way Jesus treats them. And all those things are a result of the work of the Spirit. And last week I was talking with someone after church, and they said, you know, I'm really struggling with this. And, and the, to clear this up, someone who is, who is manufacturing the Christian life, and they, they've, been, they've been sold this bill of goods that a good Christian is someone who does these things, and that's all that they do, and they do it under their power, they're missing the point. But the person who's walking in the Spirit not only do they bear the fruit and do all the things that the work of God does, but they're also, you're going to see these other things show up. It's not that reading your Bible, praying, going to church is a bad thing. That's not, but if it, that's all you're doing and you think that is Christianity, then you've missed the point. Because Christianity is not these things. Christianity is having this intimate walk with God and the result is you desire to do these things over here. Does that make sense? Does that help? Then, then two weeks ago, we looked at who Jesus really is. Not the Jesus of our culture, but who God says, who Paul writes that Jesus is. That he's the creator. He's the firstborn from the dead. And we went through and we talked about these seven amazing qualities that identify Christ. Not as this cultural uh, prophet, but rather as God in the flesh who died on the cross to pay for our sins. And we really kind of tried to see the difference between him and all the other prophets. Because that's one thing that's very critical, not just to Christianity, but it's critical to our daily lives. That we have, we have a true understanding of who Christ is and not some man-made version of him. And then last week, we began to look at what does the church look like? What is the mission of the church? And we talked about how Paul says that the desire is that we present everyone fully mature in Christ. That we present them as disciples, as followers. Not just as, as people who are falling from a distance, but people who have an intimate, vibrant relationship with God. And that is why we've come together. That's why God brings us together. That is our mission. And yet, I fear, and as you remember last week, we talked about the different types of churches that, that have sprung forth in our culture, I fear that, that we have moved from a church that has a high responsibility, a high relational responsibility, and I'm talking about the church in general, not necessarily our specific church, but that we've moved from this, from this body of believers who are called not just to, to touch the world for God, but we're called to spur one another along toward love and good deeds, that we've moved to this country club or to this consumer church or to this corporate model that even though the intent is to make disciples, the result is we're making something less than a disciple. And I, I shared last week with you that my conviction, my heart, the reason I get up in the morning 
is to try to, to, to explode this faulty concept. Because I see so many people walking around who call themselves Christians, and yet you can tell by either by their lives or by their conversations that it's, they, they really just don't get it. They've got some religious version of Christianity instead of a relationship with God. And by the way, this isn't the first time this happened. When Jesus came on the scene, there was a whole group of people that were very religious. They were actually the keepers of the code, so to speak. And yet they were constantly steering people away from God. It's, it's not a good thing when the church is that which inhibits people from coming to know Christ. And see, that's where I fear is happening. We have all these different cultural brands, all these attractional models, all these different churches that their intent is right, but because of the way they're structured, they're not presenting people fully mature in Christ. And that's a problem. Well, today as we, we jump deeper into chapter 2, Paul is going to address what I call grace robbers. Because the goal is that we are fully mature in Christ. And so what's happening both outside and inside the body of Christ, there are these grace robbers. There are these people that are trying to, to take this amazing grace that God has given us. And, and instead of allowing us to experience the freedom of following Christ, they're trying to incarcerate. They're trying to incapacitate us so that we have this man-made strategy, this man-made philosophy. And so Paul is going to jump into this, and he's going to say, let me, let me address how you cannot get hijacked in your faith. Thanksgiving 1971 in Portland, Oregon, a guy named D.B. Cooper paid $20 to get on an airplane, air flight from Portland to Seattle, Washington. I don't know if you remember this or heard this story, but he gets on the plane He's sitting in his seat. He calls the, the flight attendant over, and he hands her a note that says, I'm hijacking this plane. I have a bomb. All he asked for, they, they land the plane. He, he let the passengers off. He asked for four parachutes and $200,000 cash. The plane took off, and the only, the only thing they know now is that it crashed somewhere in the Washington wilderness, and D.B. Cooper was never again to be found. Hijacked. Can you imagine how terrifying it is to be hijacked? And yet the truth is, I see people day in and day out. I see people in the body of Christ. I see people who call themselves Christians hijacked by life, hijacked by bad teaching, hijacked by untruth. I'm not going to call out this pastor. I'm not even going to call out his church, but a couple of, couple of weeks ago, one of the most prominent pastors in America, his wife stood up and espoused one of the greatest heresies I've ever heard come from, from the mouth of anyone standing in the pulpit with thousands of people in the audience said, I believe God, that the worship of God is when we worship ourselves. Horrible, inaccurate teaching that holds people captive. And it happens every day on television, not just from the press, not just from our culture, not just from those that are anti-God, but it's coming from the mouths of people who stand in pulpits who have not rightly divided the word of truth, and they're teaching heretical thoughts, heretical ideas, and sometimes it's even unintentional. But it's happening over and over and over. <laughs> And so Paul, designed to help us, Paul, because he wants us to be fully mature in Christ, Paul, because he wants us to experience what it means to walk in stride with his spirit, he gives us three, three principles in chapter two to help us. And I want to quickly run through these, and I'm going to tell you, they are, they are laced, they are lined with theology. So you need to put on your thinking caps, and you need to get a pen and piece of paper, because you might want to go back and look at some of these on your own. Father, I pray now that you would bless 
your word that you would give clarity of thought so that we can understand what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing he says is be aware of the threat. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. The phrase here, takes you captive, it means to kidnap. It means to carry off with the spoils of war. It means to get hijacked. You know, watching someone get hijacked is one of the most painful things I've ever witnessed in my life. And the truth is, and I'm probably going to get extremely emotional about this, but you're going to have to bear with me. The truth is, my wife and I almost daily watch our son get hijacked by Fragile X Syndrome. For those of you who know, we have a child, he turns 11 today, Colin. One of the most precious children I've ever been around. This last, or two weeks ago, three weeks ago, he and his mom were get, having a discussion and he was not happy about things and Meg was not happy with him. And then he turns, when I think she was ready just about to, to give him some firm discipline, he turns and looks at her and goes, Mommy, God gave me you to love me. I think he's safe for at least a year. <laughs> Fragile X syndrome is the leading cause of inherited intellectual disabilities as a result of a genetic mutation. That's just one of many problems. And he has sensory processing disorder. But the thing that, that is the most difficult and where we see him get hijacked is because of anxiety. If he gets into a situation, and it can happen like that, where he feels out of control, out of place, anxiety will overwhelm him. And in an instant, it's almost like he loses the impulse control. And he can sometimes be a little combative. Sometimes he's protective. Sometimes he flees. But it can go from 30 seconds that we've seen as long as 20, 25 minutes that he is not himself. He's hijacked. He's, in, he's under the control of this genetic mutation. And every time it happens, it just about destroys us because we want to help him. We want to release him. And folks, you don't have to have fragile X syndrome to have your life hijacked. To me, the, the most terrifying thing that a church can do is to not care when people are hijacked by life, or even worse, when they actually do the hijacking by teaching people inaccurately God's truth. Paul is, is, is concerned about this. Because you remember back in chapter 1, he says, listen, folks, you've been rescued from the dominion of darkness. You've been brought, you've been colonized into the kingdom of his son in whom he loves. And you now have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. You have a relationship with God and you've been set free into Christ. And so he says, don't allow yourself to be hijacked. How? By hollow, which is the word empty and deceptive uh, teachings that are not in alignment with truth. He says, do not be, be, be held captive by hollow and deceptive philosophies that are based in human tradition, that are based according to the elementary teachings of this world. But see, this is exactly what was happening. It's interesting because Paul, this is the only time he uses this word philosophy in, in, in the New Testament. And what he's referring to is this heresy of universalism. See, in this culture, we've talked about many times, they had Jewish ceremonialism. They had, they had the oriental mystical religions. They had the, the philosophies of Rome and, and, and of, of the Greeks. They had the, the, the religions of the Romans and the Greeks. And all this melting pot, and, and this, there's this concept, there's this universal thought that's being brought by what they call the Colossian heresy. That, that is infiltrating the church and it's holding people captive because it's teaching people that there are all these limits, these boundaries. We're going to talk about those in just a moment. But every one of these are intended to move us away from the freedom and the grace that we have in Christ. And folks, it is no different today. It is no different. 
Every single one of us, every single day, we're, bat we're battling the philosophies of this world, the strategy of this world, the humanism of this world, whether it's from atheistic thoughts or whether it's from well-intended people that are wrong handling God's word. We're being taught and it's all being synthesized and, 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 and we're, we're fighting for a purity of doctrine so that we can have a right relationship with God. And so Paul is, 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 when he's sharing with the Colossians, he's saying, you've got to be aware of this problem. You've got to be aware of this threat because if you ever drop your guard, you will be drawn into it. You'll be, you'll be lassoed and pulled, and, and, and it's a very slippery slope. Chances are that there are quite a few people here today because of religious traditions, because of earthly traditions, because of things that you were taught as a child, that you have a major flaw in your theology that affects your daily walk, that affects your dependence on God, that affects your trust in God. Now, did you, did you intentionally pick that up? No, you didn't. And neither did I. And that's why we have to rightly divide. That's the reason we have to come back and we have to, to take this as the word of God and we have to believe that it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. We have to get our truth not from our denomination but from our scripture. And that's not to say that the Baptist denomination doesn't have good doctrine. But the truth is, I could lay out the doctrine of a number of different churches, a number of different denominations, and you're going to see a major difference in thought. We can't all be right when we have such differences. We can all be wrong, but we can't all be right. I'll tell you why I'm a Baptist, because in looking at all the different denominations, and then coming back to the scripture, I believe that as Baptists, we are closest to what God intended, more so than any other denomination. Personally, I'm a biblicist first and a Baptist second. Now, some of you might want me to run out on a rail right now. And I'll take my chances to stand on God's word. He doesn't just say be aware of the threats. He also says be alert to the tactics. Notice this. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or, or with regard to religious festivals, new moon celebration. These are a shadow of the things that come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. And don't let anyone who delights in false humility or the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with the idle notions. He has lost connection with the head, which is Christ, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why as though do you still live as why, why as though do you still belong to it? You submit to its rules. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they're based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. What does that mean? Paul is going to give us three different mediums Three extremes that are our constant threat to our faith. Can you allow me to have the screen? Yep, there we go. So he starts out and he says, number one, don't be incriminated by legalism. He's going to show us, let me turn my pen on here. He's going to show us three extremes. Now, the Christian life is somewhere in the middle. 
and balance because there are rules in Christianity. There is emotion in Christianity and there is a sense of self-denial in Christianity. But what was happening in this day, and really what happens in our day, we're, we're taught, if, 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 if someone grew up in a, in, a, in a church situation that was incredibly legalistic, they run to the opposite extreme of that. If someone grew up in a very emotional situation without truth, without boundaries, they run the opposite direction. And this is what was happening then, and this is the same thing that's happening today. The first is legalism. He says, don't be incriminated. Don't, be, don't allow legalism to hold you captive. And he, and he goes through and he says, people will try to judge you. That is, they'll try to take you to task. They'll, they'll, they'll desire to condemn one another with unfound criticism. And he tells us right here the tactics. He says, they'll judge your food intake. They'll judge your religious activity according to r- ritual and tradition. They'll judge you even by your attendance at church, at the synagogue. And Paul says, don't let someone convince you your faith isn't alive, your faith isn't real because you don't practice their rituals, because you don't drink, don't smoke, don't cuss, and don't go out with girls who do. He, he says, don't, don't allow people to, put you, to, to push you to an extreme of legalism rules so that it steals away from your faith. I remember as a kid, I went to a church and I was visiting the church, and I was and at that time my hair was about down to here, and I had the strangest looks, and I even had people come up and make comments to me because my hair touched my collar. Folks, does God care about your hair? I can tell you, he doesn't care about mine because he's caused it to go. <laughs> Ties. I think it's nice to dress up, and I think, it, I think that, that there, there's nothing wrong for those who want to wear ties, but I've been in churches where a tie is like a phylactery. A tie, if you're not wearing a tie, then you're going to hell, men. That's legalism. That's taking, that's taking the freedom of Christ and trying to impose human rules on it to define it. Now, that doesn't mean that there are not rules within the faith. There are rules within the faith. But yet, at the same time, what was happening here was the same thing that was happening in Jesus' day. Do you realize that in Jesus' day, the Pharisees had 613 laws that they were imposing on the people? 365 were negative, 248 were positive. And by the time Jesus arrived, they had this sterile religion that was just simply trying to keep people held captive. They were inhibiting people from coming to know God by their rules. Listen to what Jesus said to them. Matthew 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind gods, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first... Clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside you are full of dead men's bones, and everything is unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. There might not be a more challenging, more, 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 direct statement of God regarding legalism in all the Bible than when Jesus does this to the Pharisees. Legalism strangles grace. Did you hear that? It strangles grace. It inhibits people from coming to have a real relationship with God. And folks, legalism is alive and well in the church today. 
and it's strangling people in their faith. Legalism is a religion of human achievement. It holds that spirituality is based on Jesus plus something else. And that something else is that you are abiding by the rules. You're conforming to man-made rules about God instead of conforming to Christ and to the guidelines he has given us in his word. Does that make sense? The second thing he says is don't be incapacitated by mysticism. Now, mysticism is nothing more than emotionalism. It's having, a, it's having a faith that's based on this pursuit of a deeper, higher emotional experience. And most of the time, mysticism is void of truth. I'm looking for an experience. Wow, I went to church today and I had this spiritual high. I didn't hear anything that was right or wrong. I just had this emotional experience. Folks, I promise you, yesterday on college campuses all over, if you saw the LSU-Mississippi game last night, there was an emotional experience last night when LSU scored that last touchdown to win the game. They were on an emotional high. Some would even say they had a religious experience. It's mysticism. It's looking for an experience void of truth. And when we do that, we find ourselves shipwrecked. We find ourselves on the outside always looking for that next moment of pleasure, that next second of elation. And can I be honest with you? Personally, I love corporate worship. I really love it. I love to, to sing and I love to, to be engaged. And I believe that worship is an all-body experience. I believe it's okay to raise your hands. You can do the touchdown Jesus. You, you can do the I surrender. You can do someone else is looking Whatever, whatever you choose to do. I probably shouldn't have said that, should I? <laughs> it's okay in worship to give your emotion. It's okay to express yourself. What's not okay is to live off of that week in and week out as the heart of your Christian experience. The heart of our Christian experience is the word of God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're to feed on. Worship is an outward expression of what God's doing in us. And yet I know of people that the reason they go to their church is not because the truth is being taught, it's because they have electrifying worship. And that's where they get their fix. That's mysticism. And, and notice what he says. He says, do not be disqualified by this. Just, it means to be ruled out by an umpire. Don't, don't be so desirous to have this hyper-spiritual experience because what it's really doing is disqualifying you in the race of faith. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Do, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, run in such a way as to win the prize? Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, a little wreath around their head. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not like, run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, preached the truth to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. It's okay to have emotion in our faith, but it cannot be emotion void of truth. And so God calls us to, to do more than have legalism or mysticism. But then there's a third thing that incarcerates us, and that's asceticism. Asceticism, 
refers to a lifestyle of denial. It's the forfeiting. It's the giving up. It's the laying things aside. And you know, it's funny because we all understand that Jesus said, if any man desire to follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. There is denial. But sometimes we go to the extreme. For example, Anthony, who was the founder of monasticism, he never changed his vest or washed his feet because he thought it made him holy. Kind of scary, isn't it? Here's one of my favorites. Simeon Stylites, a monk, spent the last 36 years of his life atop of a 50-foot pillar because he mistakenly thought that the path to spirituality lay in exposing his body to the elements and withdrawing from the world. And this was done in the name of Jesus. Yes, that's an extreme, but see, this is what was happening. In Jesus' time, it's also happening in our time. I've had people tell me as, as a pastor that I should make very little money because it's an act of sacrifice. And so the, the concept of if you're poor, then that makes you spiritual. No. No. It's a form of asceticism. And so what was happening in Jesus' day and what was, excuse me, what's happened in Paul and the Colossians is the same thing that happens to us is that these three heresies, these three concepts drive too many churches in how they do what they do and how they teach what they teach. And it's pulling people away from the grace of God. These are the grace robbers. Does that make sense? I know I'm more teaching than, than I am preaching this morning, but, but, I, but I think these are critical things, especially after last week when we came and God moved in such a powerful way. This is almost like a, a, a check to last week. Because, yes, we want to see God move and we want to be able to respond to him but then we've also got to leave where we are and actually go live what we say we believe. And we can't be held captive by these grace robbers. So let me get to this last thing. So first, be aware of the, of the threats. Be alert to the tactics. And how do we do that? We are to be aligned with the truth. I got like eight minutes to, to, to teach you some really good stuff. So buckle up and get ready. He gives us four, four things if we're going to be aligned to the truth. And they all have to do with being in Christ. Go back to verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, in Christ. How? Rooted and built up in him. Strengthened in the faith as you were taught with overflowing thankfulness. The first thing is we have to live in his presence. We have to be rooted and built up. We need to make sure that we, we send down through our own personal lives, we send down roots so that we can have a firm faith so that we can be steadfast, immovable, always abound in the work of the Lord. Yes, it requires that you go to a church that's teaching God's truth, that is expecting you to walk in obedience with God, that's doing everything they can to help you to accomplish that. But ultimately, there's just one person responsible for the condition of your spiritual life. Do you know who it is? It's you. I've shared this before. Don't you dare believe one single word that comes out of my mouth until you've gone back and you've checked it yourself. And while I'm responsible under God to make sure that the word of God is taught accurately, you are the one who has to protect your heart. You are the one who has to go back and say, was this accurate teaching? Because if it is accurate teaching, you now become responsible for living it. Does that make sense? And so we have, we have to be rooted. We have to be strengthened. All of this comes 
as we put ourselves in a position, as we come to God and we say, God, I want to spend time in your word. God, I want to seek you. I want to know you. I want to worship you. I want my life to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. But it requires your effort. It requires your response to what God has already done for you. But then he says that you can't just live in his presence. You also have to live in his power. Drop down to verse 9. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you've been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. It makes me think back where he looks at his disciples and says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, therefore, go into the world and make disciples. See, Jesus, he has his power. It's imbued inside of his deity. He is God in the flesh. It goes back to two weeks ago. He is the firstborn. He is the creator. And he takes that power and he gives it to you and me through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he says, now go live in this power. Go and, and, and be my disciples. Not go do my disciples, go be my disciples because I've given you all of my power, all of my authority. And when you operate in the Christian life under his power and authority, you will have all the resources of God at your spiritual fingertips to accomplish the commission he has laid upon your life, which is to go and present everyone fully mature in Christ. In 2 Peter, he says he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. You have everything, I have everything right now to be a follower of Christ, to succeed as a follower of Christ. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you have everything you need to succeed in the Christian life? Because that's what he's saying. He goes, here's how it lives in you. This word lives, very interesting. It means to dwell. It means to settle down or to be at home. God's spirit is at home inside of you so that you can accomplish his will and his way. And then he makes this unbelievable statement. He says, not only do you live in his presence, you live in his power, but you need to live in his protection. Watch this. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised in him through, through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. He, he says, he uses this symbol, this, this event that happened in the Old Testament, circumcision. Circumcision started in Genesis chapter 15, goes through verse 18. It's, it's, it's an event that happens in covenant with God. Abraham has gone to God, and, and, and God makes a promise to him. And in this alliance, which is what circumcision is, it's alliance. It's an alliance made by covenant, and it requires the cutting of flesh. And so God goes to Abraham and says, Abraham, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, to, to the, here's my promise to you. I want you to take these animals, cut them in half, line them aside, and walk through it as a covenant to me. It required the shedding of blood. And once that, that, that event took place, God says to Abraham, okay, and as a mark, as a symbol of this covenant, here's what I'm going to require of you. I'm going to require the cutting of the male foreskin as a symbolic gesture of our relationship, our covenant with each other. It is an amazing picture of promise. And that promise is that God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. God will not go back on his promises. God will, be, God will, God will stand with you. He will give you all of his resources. He will, he will protect you. You have security in your faith because you have the identifying mark of promise with God. It is an amazing picture of the love of God and of the grace of God. What happened, though, to the Jewish people is they took this identifying mark and they made it something God never intended for it to become. Because on the eighth day, every child 
would then be performed with this act of circumcision. And so the Jews began to say, we're circumcised, the Gentiles are not, so we're okay with God, but they're not okay with God. And so what was intended to be an identifying mark of faith became an identifying mark of religion, and the result was people began to shift away from God. You know what's happened in the church today? Baptism and Lord's Supper have now what was intended to be an identifying mark of faith. There are now people that believe because they've been dunked, but they've never had an exchange, a transaction of faith, that they're okay. There are children, there may be an adult in this room, that you're banking your faith on the fact that when you were smaller, when you were younger, someone dunked you in water and you don't even remember why. But you're okay because you've been dunked in water. The Catholic Church teaches that they sprinkle you with water, then you're, you're, you're covered until you can confirm your faith. And that's nowhere found in the Scripture. It sounds good, but it's biblically inaccurate. If you think by partaking in the Lord's Supper that somehow there's going to be a transferring of the substance and God's going to give you his grace, you have missed the point. It's a meal of remembrance that his body was broken and his blood was spilled. It's a, it's a remembrance of faith. And yet this is happening. And the truth is, when we come to faith in Christ and we're baptized, it's really a picture of covenant. That just as he was buried in his death, and raised to life, I'm buried with him, that I have been crucified with him. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. It's, it's, it's not something that's a human covering for my sin. It is a promise of covenant that I am in a relationship with an almighty God. It's about our protection. It's about our security in Christ. I like what one commentator said. We're talking about baptism and Lord's Supper, or even circumcision for this matter. God isn't interested in slapping a coat of paint on you to cover the blemishes. He wants to completely restore and regenerate his lost creation from the inside out. He desires to cut away the sinfulness of the inner man so that the heart, so that our hearts will be in tune with his heart. And then there's one last thing he tells us, and this is so awesome. He says, live in his presence, live in his power, live in in his, in his protection, but also live in his provision. When you were dead, that is depraved, condemned, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive. Did you make yourself alive? God makes us alive. God is the one who transfers us from death to, to life by grace. And then he says, he forgave us our sins. Having canceled the written code with its regulations, that was against us and stood opposed to us, he took it away by nailing it to the cross. The phrase forgive means to cancel the written code. Do you remember why God gave the, Old, gave the Ten Commandments, gave the Old Testament rules and laws? It wasn't because it was a mechanism to salvation. It wasn't that I could do these things and get God. It was to reveal to me that I could not do these things, and therefore I'm condemned, I'm a sinner, and I need a solution that only God can provide for my sin. And that is Christ. And so this rule, this law, it's canceled. It's wiped out. In fact, the word canceled is a great word. It means to wash over or wipe out. The word was used for the wiping of the memory of an experience or the canceling of a vote or a debt. In one particular, in one particular situation, it was used of a scribe that he would wash off the mistakes that he made on a, on a papyrus. And so the concept here is that God canceled our indebtedness and the penalty that we were due. He literally wipes the slate clean. And that is done by an act of grace. It's done not because we deserve it. It's done because his blood is poured out and it washes away. Though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Why? Because 
his sacrifice was sufficient to pay for my debt of sin. That's what it means. And look at this. He says, now having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made public spectacle of them, triumphing over them on the cross. He disarms Satan, his enemies, all that which is going the opposite of God. He strips them of their dominion. He strips them of their rule. He strips them of their authority. He makes a public spectacle of them. And I love this last part. And he triumphs over them. This word here refers to a Roman general who, won, when he would win a great victory, they would, they would come to, into, into the city and he would be riding on his stallion and his troops would be behind them and all their enemies are, are in tow with their hands and their feet bound walking behind because he is making a spectacle of them because they have victory. They conquered them. Jesus conquered that which is, which is about sin and death and Satan and evil and everything that's opposed to God, he conquered it. And he says, live in this provision. Live in the knowledge that Satan has been defeated, that sin no longer has authority over your life. Live in your identity that Christ in you is your hope. That's what he's saying. It's an amazing, amazing picture. And so here's your option. Here's my option. Because it looks good, because it feels good, because it's politically or even church correct, politically church correct, you can live in legalism, you can live in mysticism, you can live in asceticism, or... You can live in Christ. Which one do you want to live in? You get to choose. Do you want to be incarcerated? Do you want to be incapacitated? How do you want to live your Christian life? You have to choose. I want to be like Joshua, but as for me and my house, I want to serve the Lord.